Namaste, everybody. All right. So just before I begin, I, I should uh, just briefly tell you about, Vikar has given you a brief about myself, but how did I come? I started off, I still am a numismatist, so my primary interest along with history of Mysore is also collecting coins uh, from Hyder and Tipu's period. Uh, it was that which started me off. How I came to rockets is again curious and uh, it started with Ram Ganesh Kamtam, Ram is here and Malika, uh, who are also my good friends. And about three years ago, uh, on one of their visits to Shimoga, they raised the point about the Mysore rockets. I was aware of the Mysore rockets, but they asked me, an interesting question, where are they? Why don't we know, eno know enough about them? And that started, that made me more curious and I started looking into it. Uh, you can call it serendipity, you can call it good luck, that this cache of rockets of all places in the world, it could have been anywhere from Dharwad in the north down to Cochin or up to Trishur was discovered in Shimoga and I was there at that time. So that's serendipitous and uh, I'm glad for it. Yes. So this, I just start off. The scope of my presentation would essentially be the early history of rockets the Mysore rocket in the Anglo, Mysore war, that's Anglo, sorry. Rediscovery of the rockets at Nagara. I'll speak a bit of Nagara. Examination of the rockets. The Mysore rocket from Congreve to the SpaceX. The way ahead or the way back. And a brief discussion. Rockets have been known for quite a long while. The early rockets, now what is essentially a rocket? It's essentially, today it is, classic, it is seen as a cylindrical object uh, which moves forward because of a combustion inside through a nozzle. But essentially rockets have always been any, a fire arrows were the earliest rockets and in India we conceptualize that a long way back. If you look at Valmiki's Ramayana, even he mentions a fire arrow. So if you look at Sajjajwala tada bano dhanushchasya mahatmana. If you look at the word jajwala, cost of flame to base, to blaze. So essentially, we had a concept of a moving flame arrow well back then. Now, who used it the first time, this concept? Credit goes at the moment to the Chinese because we have evidence of that. So, this is a 17th century manuscript. Uh, copied from an earlier 11th century one, which essentially shows an early fire arrow, which is essentially an arrow strapped to an incendiary cylindrical device with a fuse you can see. So this was essentially an early rocket. Uh, we know the construction of this particular piece, so it would have been made of, of a small bamboo casing with powder inside. Huh. So these fire arrows first came into India along with the Mongol incursions which happened during the time of the Delhi Sultanate. We have records of them, the Mongols shooting arrows, fire arrows at the Sultanate troops. They were widely used during the Mughal period. We have accounts of Akbar, example, ordering 10,000 rockets to be delivered to a garrison which was under siege. They were used widely in the Deccan, which is South India, essentially by the Bahmani Sultanates which came after them and by the Marathas. Yes. Now we come to the Mysore rockets. So the fire arrow which was also called a rocket, 
the fire arrows were also called rockets. So the rocket is basically an Italian word. And the first time the British saw the rocket was in Mysore. And this rocket was different. This was a metal case rocket. So all these rockets which I spoke of in the earlier three slides were rockets made of wood, usually bamboo or a kind of paper which had powder inside and which would, which would also propel forward. However, a problem with that was because it was wood or paper, it would burn out fast and the range would be far less. However, they were also dangerous in the sense that it was more of a nuisance to the enemy. It would come down, set fire to tents, scare pack animals, even hurt people. But it was regarded more as a nuisance value. Um, Jahangir, when he was besieging Malikambar, writes about Malikambar's the Dakhanis shooting showers of fire arrows on him, on the Mughal army, and he uses the word fireworks and rockets. Rockets are essentially called Bana. So that name stuck then, even today. Um, so they were classified along with fireworks, which meant that they were not really taken very seriously. I speak of fire, the fire arrows not just in India and China, but at, at the same time, a lot of work on fire arrows was also happening in Europe, especially post the Renaissance there. Italy was a large center because of the contact with Turkey. Genoa, Venice was a large center of where a lot of work on rockets was happening. The British, when they came to India and during the course of the Anglo-Mysore Wars, encountered the metal case rockets for the first time. This was something totally new to them. And it was they who mentioned the fear and the scare that these rockets caused. So Major de Rome in 1792, um, especially in the, after the, during the course of the third Anglo-Mysore War, writes of a shower of rockets, some of which entered the head of the column, that is the British column, passing through its rear, causing deaths, wounds, and dreadful lacerations from the long bamboos of 20 or 30 feet, which are invariably attached to them. The instant a rocket passes through a man's body, it resumes its initial impetus of force and will thus destroy 10 or 20 until the combustible matter with which it is charged becomes expended. Now, um, it is believed that the British were the first to write about iron case rockets. Yes, that is the evidence available till now, but I have also seen some of the Dutch archives, especially in Amsterdam, wherein they have depicted rockets, but again, during Haider's incursion into the Malabar. So this, this would probably, this would be in the 1770s and the 1780s, wherein they have shown it. It was a curiosity for them also. Yet, they did not explicitly, the documents I saw did not explicitly mention iron case rockets. It was only when the British started coming here and started fighting with the Mysoreans that they were fascinated with the metal case rockets. Robert Holm, who during the course of the Third Anglo-Mysore War and the settlement with Cornwallis, uh, the definitive treaty, uh, drew a large number of watercolors of imported forts, uh, characters of that period, both British and Mysorean. And he also drew two watercolors of rocket men. So here we see Tipu's rocket man, typically called a Bandar. So the Barna is a rocket. And this is also very, I, I find this very fascinating and maybe this is the way how the Indian mind works and how a Western mind works. Even though the iron case rocket was drastically different from a wooden case, wooden case rocket or even an arrow, um, it was still called a Barna because the purpose was probably the same. So I, I find that very fascinating. We do not even change the name. So this is a Barnadar of Tipu. So Dar is the Farsi when you hold something. And a Barna, of course. So a Barnadar from Tipu's time, 
of his army, so he, his purple uniform with the white babri or the tiger stripes, and he is obviously lighting the fuse of a rocket. Um, you can see the cylindrical rocket tied with leather hide to a bamboo stick. So the bamboo stick was essentially what Cap Jerome wrote earlier. It comes and hits the column. Um, they were not only tied to bamboo sticks, they were also tied to steel blades. The heavier ones among them is tied to steel blades, so the damage was greater. Now, this was the big question till we got the rockets in Nagara. Um, till the year 2002, there were only two full rockets available anywhere, Mysore rockets available anywhere else in the world, and both of them were in England at the Woolwich Armory. There were three other rockets, we just realized now, which have never been displaced, displayed in the Bangalore Museum, but they are emptied of the powder. They were probably brought here during the British time, and they have never been displayed. <clears throat> so if you take the two full rockets and three partial rockets, where all that was there, even though we know that rockets were used profusely in 18th century India, not just by Tipu, we also know that at that particular period, the Marathas used rockets. The, we also know that Haider, because I have read, so it's Haider on an expedition to Sandur against the Gorpades, was again faced with rockets from the other direction. <coughs> the Nizam used rockets also. We do not know <coughs> Sorry, we still do not know or whether they were iron case rockets. In all probability, they were. So the, the question, when I started studying these rockets, I also went by this common belief that it was Tipu who, uh, or it was during Haider's time, not essentially Tipu, where the first iron case rockets were made. I still go by that because we only have evidence of that. Yet, I believe that we still need to go back and see if perhaps they may not have, they may have been used in the Deccan by the Marathas or the Nizam Shahis or the Bijapuris. Uh, that is something because I have seen uh, Maratha inventory, ordnance inventory, wherein they classify Barnas with other iron ordnance. So, yet, no one describes them whether they are iron rockets or wooden rockets. So this is something that more research needs to be done. However, even though I do not claim or cannot claim that it was in Hyder's time that the first iron rockets were made, as is mostly claimed now, I still claim that it was Hyder and Tipu, especially Tipu, who used the rocket to the maximum use. So you have a weapon, an army has a weapon. It is not that the same weapon will be used similarly by all other armies. It is how you use that weapon, how you position that weapon, how you put people around them, how you train people to use them is a weapon effective in battle. That would be Tipu and rocketry. He used the rockets to the maximum potential that they served. Yes, coming back to this question, where did all these rockets go? So there were tens of thousands. In fact, the return of ordinance after 1799, after Tipu's death. So it, it clearly said that there were about 14,000 rockets in Sri Rangapatna alone. And there would have been rockets in Nagara, in Chitradurga, all over the place. So where did they all go? Again, we get a clue because in, in 1863 itself, we know that in Tumkur, uh, in Sira, actually, the British found rockets and they went around destroying them. So there was someone, an engineer, a sapper, was called and he went around exploding those rockets. So in most cases, we believe that the rockets were destroyed, either because they didn't want to use them or for safety. Now, it was, we were always curious of how these rockets worked. We didn't know if they were cast or they were rolled, what was their weight, what was the powder inside, how did they work, what was their range. That is just because there were only two rockets in this whole world. That, that was in England. Hmm. 
Yes. And this is where suddenly in 2002, so I call this a wedding and a well. Uh, in Nagara, which is in Shimoga, which is about 60 kilometers from Shimoga, uh, there was a wedding happening at the house of a, a, a planter, a farmer. His name was, he passed away the last month. His name was Nagaraj Rao. His daughter was getting married. And he had bought this piece of land, which was very near the Nagara fort. Nagara is a small town anyway. And he had a well which dried up and it was his daughter's wedding, so he needed water for the guests. The, what, the wedding was scheduled to happen in a month's time. So they had already observed when they bought the land that there was a ring of stones which they knew was an old abandoned well. So they assumed that you will, since it's an old well, you don't need a diviner to check if there's water. There should be water there. And they started digging the well manually. This, when they went to a, a depth of about 12 feet, they started getting water. So Nagara is a very, I mean, it, you get profuse rains there. So water is never issued there. So 12 feet they struck water. They went more, and along with the mud, they started getting cylindrical tubes. Uh, they went down further. They went to a depth of about 30 feet, and all this was done manually. And one by one, they started getting these cylindrical tubes. Mr. Nagaraj Rao's friend, so this also we are lucky about it, most villagers generally throw away such stuff unless it's of, val it's of no value to them. If it's gold, they take it home or it's scattered around by the labor, it never comes. But this was just cylindrical tubes. And Mr. Nagaraj Rao was a gentleman, he was a headmaster. And his friend was also incidentally the curator, the then curator of the Shimoga Shivapanayaka Palace Government Museum. So he put a word to him and the curator by the name Mr. Gangadhar came there. He did not have a clue of what this was. Yet, since it was not a treasure trove, but it was an archaeological trove, he took 160 of those pieces and moved them to the Shivapanayaka Museum. This happened in 2002. In, it was entered into, it was not entered into the accession register, but it was entered as a note that these were shells. In Kannada, we call them gundu. So because they look like artillery shells and nobody had a clue, nobody had ever seen how a locket even looked like. So it stayed there for eight years in a gunny bag, in a box, in a wooden crate in the storeroom. In 2010, the then um, the deputy director, Mr. Siddhan Gowder, he had seen the two rockets at Woolwich when he was there on a, on a training program in England. And he had saw photographs of these particular pieces. He recognized that they were rock rockets and he wrote a monograph about them in 2010. Yet for some reason, it was not taken seriously or no one knew the importance of it. It continued, stayed there till 2013 in that bag, in that wooden crate, not even entered its accession register and still labeled as shells. In 2013, uh, after I met Ram, I started looking for any reference to rockets. And it was then that I observed this monograph. And I went down to the museum and checked if they were there. They said that it was not there because it had not been entered into the register. And they didn't know, they had no clue of what a rocket was. So after a search was done, they found these pieces. And that was how the rockets came to light. Subsequently, it was entered into the register and it, it is, they are still on display there. Yes, where does Nagara lie? So if you look at Mysore, so you see Mysore there and you can see Bednur. So that is bang on top of the M there. So that's Bednur. It used to be called Bednur or Bidurur, Bidnur and then Nagara. So it was 
it was a Nayaka town, so it was the capital, one of the capitals of the Nayaka kings. So the Nayakas, after the collapse or the eclipse of Vijayanagara, were prominent Palagars and they took over the entire country, that part of the area, all the way from North Canara down up to Kasargod. So you go to Bekal Fort, you go to all these areas, these are typical Nayaka areas. And Bednur was one of their capitals, which they called Nagara because any town which had more than a lakh of homes was called Nagara. So it has a lakh of inhabitants. Hyder conquered Nagara, and this was when Hyder's Mysore's luck changed. So Mysore was transformed from a small principality to a principality which took custody of the richest part of Karnataka with an access to the coast, both Honnavara as well as Kasargod. And Hyder was besotted with Nagara, and he changed the name from Nagara to Hyder Nagara. You have a number of his coins. They're scarce, but you still find them. The name Hyder Nagara. One of his biographers, contemporaries, writes that Hyder had planned that should he have a tiff with the Wadiars to shift his base and establish his own kingdom there, rule directly from Nagara. Yeah, that's in short for you, how Shimoga looks like and where you have Nagara. So that you see Hosnagar there, so that is where Nagara comes. Hosnagara is just seven kilometers away from Nagara, somewhere after the Nagar Kuta or the Nagar Dange, we call it in Kannada, which happened during the Wadiyar rule, Mumadi's rule, wherein the farmers rose in rebellion against excessive taxation. The British took over <coughs> and the capital was shifted to Hosnagara, that is new Nagara. Uh, Nagara is an archaeological dream come true because unlike cities like Bangalore, or even Shimoga to an extent, um, they have not, it has not improved or developed much, it has only deteriorated with time. So all what was there, though in rubble and ruins, is still there. You have a large fort there. In 2013, after we went there and we got it entered that these are rockets and it was formally entered into the register, over the past two years, there have been two debris clearances, uh, not full-scale excavations, debris clearances of that. And till date, over 3,000 rockets have been recovered there. Yes. So this was a brilliant opportunity for us to study what these rockets were and the technology that may have gone into them. The Karnataka State Department of Archaeology, Museum and Heritage was kind enough to give us permission to test them and to see them, provided we wrote a report on them. Uh, so Mr. Shejeshwar, who is a curator and assistant director, associated with me, and uh, Dr. Mukunda of the Indian Institute of Science, Combustion Gases, Dr. Shada Srinivasan, she's there here. She helped us in the archaeometallurgy part. Um, one of our friends, Dr. Ajay, Ajay Sharma, helped with mapping Nagara, and we had Mr. Divekar of Perfect Alloys who helped us with the lab, with the laboratory. So it was a team that we built, and we, it, it did take work of about a, about a year of mails, checks, till we came up with something. So these are how the rockets look like. So these were 10 random samples on sizes that we took. So you can see that they're cylindrical, they're made of metal, these are the lengths in millimeters, so 20. Um, this was a sampling that we did, but the later, so these samples were done on the 160 pieces, but later when we got 3,000 pieces, we've seen that the longest, the longest one measures 380 mm, so that is about 38 centimeters. That's a large one. The diameter varies between 48, 35, 33 to 65. The long one went up to 72 mm. The weight is between a half kg to one, 1.1 kgs. These are close-up images. The 
That's the head end. So the head end is the forward end, and that is the fuse end of the rocket. We call it the aft end. You can observe the fuse there. That's on the right side. Uh, observe the a brown color coating there, quite different from the metal. That's a very interesting part. An X-ray image. So again, you see the fuse on the right. You see that there's some substance inside, but it's light colored. You see sealed, two sealed caps at both the ends. Yes. So we were very curious as to what, before we even really started getting into the rocket or doing other tests on it, or what the brown colored substance was. And this was something which is very, very innovative of the Mysorean engineers who did this. Now, the reason why in the West or in China or earlier Indian rocketry, they could not perfect the metal casing was largely because, because it is not that no one would have thought about a metal casing. Um, stone Age weapons were stone axes. Neolithic tools were made of stone. So obviously, as you develop from stone to iron to bronze, then to iron, it is obvious that somebody would have thought of moving from wood to iron. Yet, they, would not, they were not able to perfect it. This is where the Mysoreans were very innovative. We found that the brown colored substance inside was nothing but clay. So clay is a refractory layer. So the amount of heat that is produced inside is absorbed by the clay. So with the duration of flight, it does not burn up the metal. So this was something very innovative on the Mysore rockets. So it keeps extreme heat developed in the combustion chamber from affecting the metal cylinder. We also did emission spectroscopy. And again, uh, none of this is very unusual, except the values of the carbon there. And Dr. Srinivasan was very helpful here. So we checked spectroscopy with, we also did a wet analysis at different points there. Um, so spectroscopy is essentially where you, there is an emission of light and depending on that, you check what are the materials or what are the elements there inside. What is amazing here was that we found the carbon inside to be between 0 0.02 to 0.3 percent. Till date, at least in 18th century metalwork, there has been, we have not come across any carbon or any metal with such low carbon. Why, what is the purpose or what, how does low carbon help metal? You are able to roll it. So it also solved another big doubt that we had, it was believed that these rockets were castings because you had to make so many of them. They were made into molds, metal was poured and they were cast. So no, they were all individually drawn or individually rolled. So this was something amazing. While putting clay can be called as an innovation, lowering the amount of carbon when you are making steel is something that requires a lot of work and a lot of technology pertinent to those times. Um, because carbon doesn't go out so easily, you need to keep pumping oxygen, that carbon has to be reduced, taken out, so that doesn't happen so easily. It has never happened. So this, this is very amazing. And these tests were done at the lab in Shimoga again and again because the person who did the tests himself did not believe that carbon could be so less, but it has been confirmed. So the first thing is the usage of clay, which works as a very good insulation, and the second is the amount of low carbon, of how they manage to keep the carbon so low, because that will help to roll the sheet. The powder showed that it is gunpowder, of course, uh, a bit of the elements, maybe potassium has gone in, you know, it, it was in water and in mud for over 200 years. So 
of the potassium nitrate, potassium is not there, but we know that it is a composition of gunpowder. The microstructure was also analyzed. We found it ferritic. Yes, there's some other tests that we did on, on the piece. Um, so how this, how we think that the rocket was made. So essentially this is mild steel. This is, the metal was steel, low carbon steel. The steel was taken, be made into plates, depending on the length of the rocket that you wanted to make. It was rolled probably using a wooden, uh, you would probably strike it on a wooden uh, piece and make it round. The seams would have been beaten. So once you had the tube open at both the ends, using heat, there would have been joining of the seams. At one end, you would put an end cap made of the same material. We tested the caps. The caps are also the same material. So one part, the cap would be put at one end of the rocket, or one part of the cylinder. And the cylinder, the top diameter would be folded onto it. That is called crimping. Once it was crimped, powder would be fused. Clay would be put inside. That's where you would put a layer of clay into the rocket or into the cylinder. After a while, powder of the required proportion would be moved inside because even the powder we suspect would change because we have reports of uh, rockets that emit flares, probably phosphorus. Uh, we have reports of rockets moving in different ways. So again, once again, depending on the packing inside, I'll come to that. We also found something very interesting with the packing. After the powder has been beaten into place, because you cannot leave air gaps inside, the powder is beaten into place, the other cap would be fit inside. The other cap would probably be hot forged, that is an amount of heat would be put and made to stick there. Uh, crimping would not have been done at the bottom of the nozzle end, because there would be a lot of pressure developed there and the crimp could open up in the tube. So the crimping we, we know was not done at the bottom end. Uh, the end cap at fitted last would have a nozzle hole and then we've also found an auger bit through which a passage would be made for the fuse to go in and your rocket would be ready. Uh, why we did a test of the bend is to see how, what kind of a bend it was. So it was, um, we know that it was beaten and made to bend. This is also interesting. We opened up the rocket. So you can see a bit of the fuse that's there. At one end, you can see the end cap. That is the aft end or the nozzle end. You can see the nozzle hole there. Observe the packing there. So, so you, you can see that there is some passage made for the fuse there, which extends till the end. The fuse is not so long, but they have Put, a, put space inside all the way from the aft end to the head end. Another piece where you see the packing is different. You can see the brown colored clay. That's the insulative layer. You can see it lying all across. So, <clears throat> We were not able to open up a lot of rockets. We could only open up a few pieces that were in damaged condition because we did not have permission to open up the good ones. But a cursory look at them showed that the Mysoreans had also learned of how to propel their rockets in different ways. So even today, you have two kinds of rockets after you pack fuel into it, solid fuel rockets. You have a radial burning rocket. So the one on the top, it's a radial burning rocket. The other one is an end burning. So the end burning rockets burn like a candle. So the upper diameter, it burns slowly down or upwards. In a radial burning rocket, you have the fuse that extends all along. 
So combustion happens faster because a larger surface area burns in that amount of time. So obviously thrust is more. So the Mysoreans had found this out also. This is the third finding. We also looked at nozzle diameters and we found that the Mysoreans are also kind of standardized nozzle diameters. The larger proportion of rockets had nozzle diameters between 8, if you look at 8 mm and 9 mm, so 8, 9, 10. So they were not doing things arbitrarily because nozzle diameters is very important to combustion and the subsequent propulsion of the, of the rocket. Well, this is the fuse magnified 50 times and uh, we think that this could be cotton or it could be silk. Uh, looking at the, uh, the diameter of each fiber. Another very important thing with regard to this find is that this is, of course, this is the first find in 200 years of rockets. This is also interesting because this is a find site where we also found tools which were used to make rockets. So this is an auger tool which is like a drill tool that we found. It actually corresponds to a Chinese manuscript where they use the same tool to drill through a rocket but that is of course a wooden rocket. So this as you can see we kept it next to the rocket. So this would have been used after the packing was done and after the end cap, nozzle end cap was also put into place to drill space through the packing, through the powder inside to give room for the fuse. Uh, we also think that whether it dip, that the amount of, uh, the distance that the tool would go through the cylinder, the rocket casing would depend on the range or the speed at which the time they wanted it to move from point A to point B as I spoke of whether it's a, um, end burning or a radial burning rocket. We also found clayware. Uh, the one at the bottom is a funnel which we think now would have been used to load the powder into the rocket. So it is hollow at both the ends. Uh, so the British were very curious about this. And after 1799, they took several pieces away to Woolwich, Woolwich essentially because that was where a lot of their ordnance was being tested, especially artillery and anything to do with gunpowder. So William Congreve was there. He and his father had begun somewhere in the 1760s working on rockets. We know very well that he had even begun experimenting on iron cased rockets. They were not successful. The same kind of uh, trials on iron case rockets were also happening in Ireland, in Dublin, where there was an active Irish rebellion going on. Uh, some kind of work on iron case rockets were also happening in France, but the person who was working on France had just come from India, and it is very probable that he had seen these rockets in action in India. So, Post-1799, when these rockets reached England, it still took time for them to understand how the insulation worked and how to lower the carbon. But in, by 1806, they were ready enough with well-improved rockets. By 1810, we still know, because Congreve wrote a small paper on the problems he was encountering with these rockets. The problems were essentially that in the cold weather, and in the dampness of England, they were not firing. So we think that the powder in Mysore, in our rockets, were mixed in such a way that dampness would not really affect them because uh, we still do not have any documentation of many rockets failing. We still don't have, we have not seen them. By 1810, the Europeans, the English, were able to use rockets. They used them to a large advantage in the Danish war when they bombarded Copenhagen. Um, we know that the White House was burned to the ground. That's when they painted it white. Rockets were used in that. 
and during the Napoleonic Wars, they were used a great deal. However, towards the 1840s and 1830s, as artillery progressed, even the Europeans moved towards cannon and towards heavy artillery. The interest in rockets moved down, which would later be reinvigorated with von Braun, the V2, and Germany, and that set off something else. Here you see how the British are firing rockets. So they're doing it in the same way. So you see them constructing special launch pads. Uh, there is a rocket court in Sri Rangapatna, but we still have not been able to figure out how it was used. We call it a rocket court because in 1799, the British surveyed Sri Rangapatna. They, they named it as a rocket court. We also now have a clue. Uh, uh, you see this uh, Robert Holmes watercolor. So you see a very curious curved wooden uh, between his legs. So we, we had no clue what that was. Now we know well that this was a part of the launch, wherein so this was an in, this is this is an early um, print of the British launching rockets post congreve so these would be congreve rockets they say a ground volley in the old indian style so what they would do is they would keep a piece of wood and they would place their rockets on it and a bunch of volleys they would set fire to it to the fuse and they would move so in all probability that stick would have been used to launch the rocket uh, later tripod sticks were in use in europe to, for most of these launches so probably this would have been fixed to the ground and a rocket would be put onto it and to it. We also know that at times, the Mysoreans launch rockets from their hands. That has also been recorded. Yes, so this is something very important that our, uh, what work we did here, very curiously uh, in England at Windsor, they had 12 such rockets. They had no clue what they were. And it was after we wrote this paper, Shayesh, me, Sharda, and all of us together, in September 2018, did Windsor realize that these were rockets? So I had, an, I had an opportunity to see them. And very curiously, out of these 14 rockets, because they have an accession register, which they have maintained from 1786 onwards. So of these 14 rockets, 12 have come in 1801 from Mysore. Two came in 1833 from Awadh, and, and, and the, two, the two of Awadh is Lucknow, of course, and the two Awadhi rockets look exactly like this. I, I had an occasion to see them, exactly like them, and they came attached to two flags of Lucknow. So they had the Mahi Martip, so the fish, so the fish was the symbol there, just like Tipu had the, bab, the, the tiger as the symbol. So that is very curious that at least by 1833, Awad also had iron case rockets. So did they have it before that? Were they all over the place? Were they just not recorded? Or did that technology go there in 25 years? That is, again, we need to see. Steel making Mysore is very interesting. And uh, so in 1800 itself, Buchanan was sent by the Duke of Wellington, the later Duke of Wellington, to look at commerce, to look at the people of, you know, study Mysore and see um, the con state of the economy there and how the British can really make use of revenues from this place. And he recorded that the forges, there were large um, towns or large hamlets or clusters of villages which specialized in making steel, iron and later steel. And he said that it was very curious to him that the output of these Indian forges or these Indian sites, smelting sites, was far, far excess of the ones in contemporary England at that time. So he writes that the amount of iron that could be made from ore in, say, six days to 14 days could be, would be made in Mysore, in the Mysorean forge in a span of six to seven hours. Uh, he has also left descriptions of that, and he speaks of the Mysorean um, technicians 
using different combinations of leaves in the crucible when they were making steel. Um, he gives the names of some of those leaves. We think some of those leaves could have been deoxidants, which affect the steel. And we now know that this, obviously they would have known how to make steel of less carbon or different kinds because he specifically says that for higher quality steel, um, like knife blades, they would use steel that was, they would use ore or mud, black mud from the riverbeds, while for plowshares, uh, utensils, kitchen vessels, uh, other such hardware, they would use stones or rock, iron, ore essentially from the hills. Uh, now we, we, we looked at the rockets. We were also curious about where they would have been made. We found them in Nagara. Um, in the course of the third Miso war, there was someone who came with the Bombay army. His name was Captain Little. He came as a detach. He came in a small English detachment that was assigned to Parshuram Bhau. So Parshuram Bhau was one of the Maratha Sardars who also brought his army here. And uh, he mentions in Shimoga, very curiously again in Shimoga, that he, after he captured Shimoga, he went, so he, he writes, the army continued in the neighborhood of Shimoga until the middle of January, inactive as to general operations, but detachments were sent here and there to reduce small forts, which was effected without material opposition. The fort of Turknahalli, commonly known, commonly called Truknalli, a place famous for making rockets was taken after a siege of a few days. Yes. So we were very curious to find Turknali or Truknali because this is the only recorded till date scene where the British have named a rocket factory. So we searched through revenue records from the late 1800s. We have not found any earlier than that in the Tasildar's office. We could not find any town by that name. So we looked around, we searched more, and we came across another town called Tadaknali. So we visited Tadaknali, which was about, um, so he's left us a clue that in a few days he besieged the place, took the place, and came back. Now, assuming that an army marches 15 kilometers a day, that would be the general uh, marching time of any army. Uh, so Tadaknali is at a distance of about 45 kilometers from Shimoga. And we went there. We found the whole place. So much of it is under cultivation, strewn with tuyers, parts of furnaces. The whole place is that. So we, we think we have identified this place. And Tadaknali was a misnomer for Turknahalli or Turknahalli. Uh, the local residents, at least the elderly ones, say they have recollections. So there's a large group of families there who were into blacksmithy or were working with ore. They no longer do that now. But the older ones mention that they have heard of people making dabbas. So dabbas are essentially cylindrical objects. It could have been that. Um, we were also curious about why 3,000 rockets were received, were recovered from a well. And very interestingly, uh, the British Library had a map of Nagara. And to our luck, serendipitous again, with a very well-written index, you know, which stretches all the way from A to K of all the important points there. And using this index and using a bit of GIS, we were able to track the exact place where we found the rockets because fortunately, Nagara has not changed at all because um, the heydays of the mid-1800s and earlier are all gone. Today, it is just a forgotten village where you have arecanut plantations all over. And even today, you go there, you 
you dig across something, you'll find a foundation of some home, or palace. Or, in fact, the palace is all gone, uh, but they know that the, the, there was a palace here. They know that the Amildar's house was here, but everything is in ruins. So uh, uh, the department is planning an archaeological, ex first a debris clearance and then an excavation, but we don't know when that is happening, but that is in the offing. Um, so we know well the rocket site, if you see, was at this point where you see H. Now H was a sandalwood factory and the point you see on top of that B, B was the arsenal. And you see a little ahead across the river, so that is the river branching into two parts. So across the river you see the D, the D was a powder factory, which is probably a gunpowder factory. So in all probability, the rockets came from the arsenal and were dumped in probably at a time when the British were nearing uh, Nagara. Nagara was taken after Sri Rangapatnam fell. It took almost a month for it. They surrendered, but probably by the time the British got there, for whatever reason, they dumped it. It is also possible that during the Nagar Dange, that is when Dhondia Vag, he, he, he rallied Tipu's disaffected troops who did not join the Wadiyars uh, into a rebellion and for a period of almost six months, much of old Mysore was in turmoil and much of the, of the fighting happened in Shimoga, Shikaripura, Nagara. It is also possible that this may have happened around that time. So we think it could have happened in 1799 or 1803, 1804, around the time, or even later during the Nagar Dange, but we do not have any recorded evidence of Mumadi, uh, that is the, the restored Wadiyar, using these rockets ever. Uh, we were also lucky, now we have moved further to studying the organization of this, so we, we have we came across a Hukum Nama, which has not been read, but we just finished reading it, and we will be publishing a paper very soon uh, about the rocket. So you, you can see Bana there, if you, if you read Kannada. So on the top you have Karnataka, Gundu, Katti, so third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and the eighth, you see Bana. So this is a record of the Banas there, which were there in the store. Uh, this is very interesting because this also gives a large number of tools that were used as part of the ordinance. Even there we find stuff like the Bairige. Bairige is the tool, the auger tool that we find there. So there is a lot of work still that can be done. Uh, we went further and at, the, and at the middle in Kerala. So Kerala is a place where still during temple festivals, the Trishur Puram, church and even mosque, largely church festivals, uh, when they have a perinal or anniversary commemorating the presiding saint of the church and in all temples wherein they fire these rockets. These are all wooden rockets. Uh, they were all wooden rockets. Then they became tin, but then because of asbestos, the government banning that, now they stopped that and very rarely do they use wooden rockets. Uh, so this gentleman here, he's in his 70s now, but when he was young, younger, or rather in the 60s and the 70s, uh, he worked on wooden rockets and he explained how it was made. And very curiously, it was made exactly in the way that I, we think that the metal rockets were made. The only difference was they would go out and use bamboo. So today bamboo is virtually non-existent in Kerala and they don't get that any longer. So they stopped that way back in the 70s. After that, they went to tin cylinders and then because the, the government banned tin and asbestos, they were essentially asbestos, so they've stopped that. Uh, in Trishur Puram, they still source bamboo and specially make rockets only for the Puram. So we find that uh, this knowledge was already there, so it is obvious that somebody at some time thought of moving wood to steel, and they also use clay, J.D. Manno, which is clay, as an insulative layer. They also use a fuse dipped in powder. Uh, fuse is actually a coir rope there. And um, 
it was exactly similar to that. So we know that this technology at some stage, now what is curious is we still don't know when did this change or transformation from wooden casing to metal casings happen. Where did it happen? We don't know. We see a lot of use, as I said, could be Bijapur, could be Maharashtra, could be the Marathas, essentially the Deccan, because we see most of this happening in the Deccan. Uh, yet, we have no evidence. Written documentation all today still suggests that it was first seen by the British during Hyder's time. That is because most of us read English sources, <coughs> or if we are in Karnataka, we read Kannada sources. It is very much possible that if we examine the Portuguese sources in Lisbon or in Goa, or the Peshwa Daftar at Pune, or in Bombay, the Bombay archives, we could find a lot more information there. Uh, yes, this is all of us, all of them who helped us and worked with us. Now, this is just about the rockets. Why was, it's another very interesting thing. I'm do we have time or are we out of time? Just five minutes. Sorry. See, it is very important to realize that Mysore was able to accomplish all this in spite of incessant war. So you saw four wars happening there. You also saw repeated incursions of the Marathas, of the Nizams. You saw internecine wars and battles with uh, Sandur, Nargund was a perennial problem, yet they managed all this because we see in Mysore the stirring of a first pre-modern Indian military industrial economy. So Mysore was the preeminent or the forerunner of a military industrial economy. So under Hyder and Tipu, they were able to capitalize revenue, they were able to capitalize taxation, such a way that there was a steady flow of money. Industrialization was happening rapidly. You, you know of Tipu writing letters for barometers, clocks, asking the French to send engineers, keeping hold of any Englishman caught and asking to drill the army or to go ahead and cast some cannon for them. So they realized very well that the Europeans could only be beaten with the techniques that the Europeans used against them. So this was another very big contribution of Mysore. And the rockets were a result of that. Not just the technology that went into it, because we are sure that they would have refined it year upon year, and they would have used it to their advantage. Because he organized, he set for every kushun, a kushun is more like a brigade, he set 50 rocket men to each kushun. So earlier rocket men, in earlier armies were used just to frighten. They would scamper around. They were simply called rocket boys. Would scamper around, frighten the army and dart away. But rockets, rocket boys or bandhas were an integral part of Tipu's army. So a strong and vibrant economy with a strong military arm, which was feeding the military, was very important for all this. And also for all this innovation that would go. I would like to speak more about that, but time is out. <laughs> Thank you. I go to Shimoga, I have to pass through those autos and then go and talk to him. <laughs> so, uh, it's open for questions. Thank you for a fascinating talk. Um, I wondered whether there was any Ottoman influence in the development of these rockets, because, you know, they were into making cannons and so on. Yes. The Nizam Shahis and the Adil Shahis. Could be. That is what we Pinhari, thought. Yeah, yeah. Because we thought, because Muslims, uh, Muslim populations then, even today in rural Karnataka, Turka. So that is a common. We thought, but we have not been able to find that anywhere. Probably that would have changed to Tadkanahalli, but we are not very sure, but we have not find we have not found Turkanahalli anywhere in the revenue records from the eighteen eighties onwards. Earlier to that, we don't know. Because in India, or in all countries, what happens, often villages get deserted, villages change names. We are aware of that. But uh, we just don't know that. Yes. About the Ottoman influence, it is possible. But on the rockets front, no. Um, 
I personally feel, uh, not because I studied Mysore uh, uh, or I have a particular interest in that, that uh, because, um, you know, when Tipu sent his embassy to, 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 the, to Constantinople, to Istanbul, um, the, the Sultan, the Sultan himself came in disguise to watch a drill of Tipu's troops. So, and uh, there is a very interesting paper written just last month uh, by a friend of mine uh, from Turkey, wherein he has looked at why, and his question is, why did the Ottoman Empire, which was failing, you know, the 1700s were a bad time for it, the late 1700s, why didn't they emulate Tipu? So the question in Turkey, the scholars like him are studying is, why were the Turks, the Ottomans, towards the later part of the 18th century, when, they were, when the Russians were, Catherine was at the tail and the Greeks were in rebellion, the Bulgarians would go out, not emulating Tipu in military drill, in collaborating with Europeans in technology, stuff like that. So if you look at ordinance of the Turks uh, of that time, I feel the Tipu's ordinance, including artillery as well as fire locks, all of which, 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 was, which was made primarily at Nagara and Patan, which is the Dar al-Sultanate, they're far superior to Ottoman uh, firearms of that time. So I would discount that fact from what I have seen at that time. Uh, and there is also, you know, a lot of people say, did he get this technology from the French? No, because we know that the French in the 1700s, late 1700s, were working on iron rockets, but they were not able to do it. So that is also ruled out. Yes, actually, I was going to ask you about the French, uh, you know, influence yeah. there. The well, I, I just wanted to comment a bit on the, the steel making please, uh, please. traditions that you pointed to, because uh, clearly, uh, some of Bukhanan's account, uh, you know, uh, relate to the wood steel making tradition, which is quite different, which is a high carbon steel tradition, which was, you know, using the crucibles, where actually it's a carburization of rota into high carbon steel. But you're also finding this highly decarburized, uh, you know, uh, steel. So, uh, you know, in some of those very large two years, you almost have to do that, you know, all, you know, if you make cast iron and then you decarburize, you would have had to approach something of a blast furnace technology. And I was just wondering what those very large two years you found. I think yes. one needs to go back there and look at okay. that site a bit they more. still so be around. So you, usually, in a very clear usually, uh, Dr. Srinivasan, they are they're visible after the harvest because all that area, they grow ragi there. So if you go after the harvest is done, you, you still find them strewn all around. Yeah. Yeah, my name is Vivek. Uh, to what Vivek. would you attribute uh, the gradual decline of the India uh, of India's military prowess over two centuries? You know, it's it's gradual, but it is. Uh. Yes, a good question, a good question, and I think the answer is rather forthright. We fail to innovate. Um, we fail to innovate in military tactics. We fail to innovate in military technology. And uh, we were divided as a country. That is a third part, but strictly from technological terms, we could not match the Europeans in firepower or in the technology that they used. We were late. Uh, when it came to firepower. That is what Tipu innovated because uh, uh, there is a record of Cosigny was the French ambassador uh, in 1782 sending 100 uh, matchlocks, not firelocks, matchlocks to Tipu and he returns them en masse saying the stuff we produce here are far better. So, yeah. Uh, I am Sayed Shafiullah. Uh, I was wondering uh, where uh, the Tipu's uh, uh, artillery or military or gun manufacturing team was getting the raw material like metal, that is the uh, raw material for uh, iron raw material, and, and the gunpowder. So I, th I think Sharda can, which, which are the prominent iron ore sites that you've seen? Well, uh, amongst the smelting uh, sites that have been uncovered around Chitradurga district, you find, for instance, Gati Hosahali, the very well-known crucible steel sites. 
and uh, Sandur, Bellari. There's a lot of uh, workings that a lot of the geological, early British Geological Survey reports also talk about. And he was talking about the black sand, which is basically magnetite, which is you know alluvial sand from from the stream, uh, you know, from from the rivers. And Kudramukh also used to have all of that. So as archaeometallurgists, we are looking at all of this a bit more. Yes. The gunpowder, now, uh, of course, that would have needed a mixture of saltpeter and sulfur and charcoal. And of course, saltpeter, the, the best known manufacturer of that is around in the Rajasthan area, and they still have that. But there are some uh, reports of finds of saltpeter even here in uh, Karnataka, because that would have been uh, somewhere along, again, you know, the Sandur and all that. But I think that much of concerted work has not been done exploring this. So that's the next stage of this, really. Uh, uh, Shafil, uh, sir. Yes. Well, I think they would have tinkered around with the constituent of gunpowder to do certain things. But sulfur, I there is a letter that Kirkpatrick translated, wherein uh, Tipu writes to his um, the Sate. He was called the Dao Sate. Uh, the Sate was his envoy at so Tipu had factories, karkhanas, in. 30 different places in India and 21 places outside India. So <clears throat> he writes to a Karkana and asking, he, 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 he also sends some material to Musket and asks that sulfur be brought from there. So we know that Musket was a source of sulfur. But was it the only source? We don't know, but we found that Musket was definitely a source of sulfur. And I should say that sulfur is also found right here in Eagle Dhar, Chitra Okay. Uh, in 1792, Tipu uh, introduced Farsi as the official administrative language. Till 1790, we think I, we think this may be done a little earlier, in 1788-89, but it took two to three years for it to come into effect. Till 1788-1790, till that time, all the documents in the court of the Wadiyars Haider and Tipu were written in two languages, Kannada as well as Marathi. There was a large Maratha, Marathi Brahmin contingent. Purnaya was a Marathi Brahmin, but from that, from the rich. So there was a large Marathi contingent, Brahmin contingent there. Uh, during Haider's time, the large proportion were the Iyengars, so the Sri Vaishnavas. He later moved across the Hindu time to the Marathi continent. So at least in 1789, 90, 91, 92, the large proportion letters are written, documentation are written from the Talukas in Canada, brought to the court, translated by another person in Marathi, so that there are two records which can be checked again. From 1792, 91, 90 onwards, Farsi was used, wherein at the Daral Sultanate, and at each taluka, when Amildar sat, a Persian Mutsati was introduced, who along with Kannada, Marathi, would make a third copy in Farsi. For example, this document is not published, it's very interesting. We have a list including names of 40 clerks who wrote, who were in charge of the stores, who were only doing the documentation. This is a, this is a source of the Sri Lanka Patna Fort. So it's a huge store. This is the largest store in the whole Mysore kingdom. So there were 40 Mutsadis. Out of that, Barashi was four. Adinaru was Hindvi. Hindvi is Marathi, not Hindi, not Hindustani. And Kannadashi, that is Kannada, was 20. So four Persian. 16 Marathi, Hindi, and 20 Kannada scribes. So, right from this document, with the names of the Kannada scribes, so there are out of these 20 Kannada scribes, 16 were writers, and 4 of them were Mashalchi. So, Mashi is Kannada for ink. So, they were ink men. Their job was just to keep supplying ink. So, this keeps the amount of money and the salaries. So, this is Dara Mahe. So in Kannada, Dara Mahe means how much you, how many are correct. So 
we know that. So this document itself shows this, which we already knew earlier. So irrespective of what people say there, it is not, I mean, how is it possible that suddenly Canada vanishes? Where do people work? Where do your village accountants write? They all wrote in Canada. They would also get it written in Marathi, and a new language called Persian came in the court. That is all when the Persian was introduced, Kannada was not uh, removed, uh, Kannada was retained as it is. Uh, Kannada was retained but it lost its prime place in the court. So that is also there. So Kannada lost its primary place in the court. It is just like Nam Rajavashe. So suddenly somebody changes it from Kannada to, I don't know, German or Marathi or somebody changes the language of Marathi from the administrative language. Change. So that, that would also that would, that would also have been a turbulent time, but that in no way removed Canada writers from the court. They continued transcribing the documents in Canada, but every document would also have a, uh, a Persian equivalent, provided they were. See now, Chibu's letters to Shrigeri Matha were not in Persian; they were in Canada. You have a host of letters of Chibu to the Hyderabad Canada area only in Telugu. It is possible that they may have been Persian records. Maybe they are not written in Marathi. So they would have written letters depending on whom they were addressing it to. But the largest part of official correspondence and revenue correspondence in the court was Persian, with the local level or the first source documents all being generated in Kannada, in Kannada speaking areas, probably Karnul, it would have been in Telugu. And Hyderabad, Karnataka, Hubli, Darwada, it would not have been Karnataka, it would have been in Modi Marathi. That would be a very, very clear <coughs> practice. Thanks, Sir. Uh, Siddharth over here. Yes, please. <coughs> Quick cut. I was reading a biography on uh, Arthur Wellesley, the Duke of Wellington, called the Duke, yes. where uh, he talks about his, uh, you know, the, his, his time in, in India and how he. Years later, even after he, he retired as Prime Minister, he would always think back to uh, an incident which occurred in the fourth Anglo Mysore War when he was approaching Shiranapatna. That uh, obviously there's no reference to it in, in the book, but obviously got set upon or attacked through the use of, of these rockets. Yes, yes. And uh, he's reported to have run away. Absolutely. Right? And which would have meant. Discard him for life. Is yeah. Obvious. And so that was. And he always said, he says, I always learned that hard lesson that, that night. Uh, so I was wondering, if I was just thinking about it, was he the first victim of shell shock? <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it remained, it scarred him for life. So that happened at Mahanarli, that, you know, the battle. So uh, it scarred him for life because five of his, uh, he was leading that team. It was a reconnaissance team. And five of his men were captured, taken alive. And in the next three days, uh, they were executed by the jetties, that is the wrestlers, twisting their necks and killing them. So it scarred him for life that five under him lost their lives that day. And he ran back. And he did not stand up to that. Because, because uh, it, was, it was a bango grove and they were just, they, they had not expected rockets coming at you from all directions. Yeah. Yeah, one second. <coughs> okay. Hi. Uh, so uh, I, I wanted to ask you a question on uh, uh, you know, rockets in Bangalore is on the issue. I've read about this place, uh, Taramandal in Jikit, which is supposed to be um, named after the rockets and like, the galaxy of stars that they create. Uh, I was just wondering, like, um, uh, are there like other such sites within the Yes, yes. Shrinagar Patna is a Taramandal plate. Okay. We know, we know well, because this document also says how many bullock carts are allocated to the Taramandal plate. Uh, so the bullock carts in all probability are to carry materials to the Taramandal plate. So Taramandal plate? Uh, Essentially it would be a rocket factory. And was a generic uh, name? In all probability, yes. That's so, what I think. So industrial parts, right? Essentially for rockets. Hi sir, this is Ahmed here. I am the presently caretaker of Deep Warmer in Bangalore. And, uh, and you take people uh, that's in Alasipalya. 
Ah. I have two, three doubts so that I can clear up with you. Please. Uh, so when I look at this uh, Tipu Armory, the time, uh, unfortunately, it was in Abundance and then the, you know, for a small time it was in Abundance. So I, I restored it by clearing the debris and other things. Uh, my doubt is, like, uh, is the armory itself being designed in such a way that it's a launching pad, number one? That's my doubt. And the second thing is, when I was working around there, uh, I shifted uh, the cannon, the Pooh cannon, you know, that was found in, uh, you know, yes. Anglo Medical College. Yes. So again, that metal, uh, I would like to ask the doctor, because uh, when I shifted that cannon, it was around 11 feet long, and uh, the, you know, the, the, uh, it was corroded in, in a way, but not to that extent, like, uh, so I was being said by a, by some people uh, over there that the, the scientists over there in the archaeological department, and the archaeology department, that yeah. it is not yeah. actually, you know, uh, steel itself, it's panchaduta or something. So I would like you to relate the, the, the material, the, you know, the, the material involved uh, in the cannons that were used. Is it the same components that are being used in the rockets? Number, number three, my question is, like, uh, was the armory, Tipo armory, which is presently there in Palasi Pardam, or armories yes. like that, bunkers like that, yes. do, do, do they have something really in, in them inside, where, where the production happening inside them, or still there are many things out there, because I can see that. If, if you can be kind enough sometime, I can take you there. Uh, that has, you know, inroads. Inroads, as brother said, that is Taraman or something. So, uh, we ha I have personally found many things, explorations happening, in and around, you know, city market areas. There is a way from Tipo Armory to, you know, to the city market. Thank you. Okay. So, thank you. See, first question, thank you, thank you, sir. Before, before I get started, the first question, could I have been any sloping for surface, could have been used for that? But I'm not sure if they would invite uh, retributory fire on an armory by, by firing rockets from that place. It sounds improbable. Second question, cannon, you say? The, 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 the cannon found there. See, uh, the return of ordnance uh, in 1799 showed that the large majority of bronze cannon were cast in Mysore, but a large number of iron cannon, which was received, which was in uh, Jipu's army, were all imports. That is, brought from England, brought from France, and there were a lot of cannon foundries all over the world. You know, they're selling cannons. You know, that is a large uh, industry then. So. We, we need not assume that because anything was found in Alasipalya or in Sriranga it should be Chipu's cannon. Uh, <coughs> a lot of these cannon, for example, if you go to the Dalla, you have five cannon, uh, or the, the, the two cannon at the entrance there, the B mark, foundry mark, so this is a prominent European mark, probably in Chipu's service. So a large proportion of iron cannon that Chipu used were not made in Sriranga the bronze cannon large part were. The third question was about, yes, armory is essentially watertight, large structures because, you know, when you are bombarded or when there is fire, nothing goes in, they only have a very small window and be tightly shut, it should not allow air, moisture inside because they are essentially powder, you know, structures where a lot of powder is also stored, not just cannon walls, it's basically powder, powder magazines. So, whether there are tunnels from there, carbon part, because the lower carbon part you sent me, hmm. so I, was, I was very interested in, in knowing as to what material with the cannons they were using. I think I, 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 I the, you know, rockets, because that's the most uh, thing. Uh, how, can how about the corrosion part, like, was, was it like... Uh, I think she can. Thank you. One would love to come and see. So, but this uh, 11 foot cannon, now actually the interesting thing though in Europe, uh, they did not make Fort Bear cannon of the size that they were made, you know, in the Deccan, yes. for instance. The Bidar cannon, if you see, it's an enormous one. Uh, it's probably one of uh, the largest, and they never made any uh, of, you know, such large cannon, although of course whether it was ceremonial or what, we don't know. But the, that's all Fort welded, where you had each of those rings sort of forged and then added on and so on. So I would expect that uh, this follows that fort welding tradition, which you also see elsewhere uh, you know, in the Deccan. In Tanger also you have an enormous fort built one, but this 11 foot one is really quite big. So we'd expect it to be of uh, very high grade wrought iron, uh, you know, for that kind of forging. But it would be wonderful, sir, if you could get her a sample, because uh, I'm just sort of speculating. But, um, um, I, I think uh, yeah, that would be wonderful. Set. You're, you're right because most of the iron cannon found in Chipu's place were largely smaller cannon, 
and uh, they, so essentially much of the cannon that was being sold all over the place uh, where yeah, exactly they could be used on ships on marine warfare as well as on forts so she, she is, you, you are right you're right large cannon even the ones that they are all are not level foot long so she could be right they could be Indian right? Uh, thank you, Nidhan, for uh, this fascinating uh, talk. One of the questions is uh, your, your uh, research findings come uh, your research findings come at a time when uh, you know, there's a uh, huge question mark on whether people engage in our books or not. So, uh, you know, the government plans to have a study panel to examine uh, this case, uh, you know, uh, as it were, in uh, history. So, uh, if the event that it comes to a situation that, uh, you know, uh, they seek more evidence or uh, basis for retaining him in, in the books, uh, would you, uh, you know, present this kind of information to the government to, you know, so that uh, there is, uh, you know, empirical evidence in front of them to, uh, you know, uh, give weight to the fact that he needs to remain in that books for the for future generations? Absolutely, in fact, it's all out. Um, so, Chipu needs to remember for his innovation of how he kept Mysore together for over 20 years of internecine warfare, how he put nine Mysore's name into the drawing rooms of America, England, and all of Europe. Uh, imagine you had plays being staged in France uh, of Chipu, in Chipu's time, um, about his religious policies. There should be another debate and what uh, I am an agnostic moving on to being an atheist. So I care two roots for religion. So, so people on that then can examine that aspect of this and write about it as they feel like. As evidence shows, not as they feel like. Actually my question is on religion. Since there are so many illusions between gods and kings, and you pointed to an interesting reference in Trishur Puram where they fire rockets. Were they, apart from defense records, were they similar uh, uh, references in religious celebratory or Utsava documents in the 18th century to rockets? Even, earlier, fire? Yeah. even earlier, the Trishur Puram has been happening since the Samutri times. So there are records of Arab travelers, uh, even during Ibn Battuta's time, of uh, him uh, hearing what Trishur Puram. And there is a very interesting uh, document called Tufat al Mujahideen, uh, written uh, about 600 years ago, and wherein the Arabs described, wherein the Arabs, you know, uh, Calicut was always dear to the Arabs because Pepper went from there, wherein the Arabs were invited to sit at the right hand of the Samu, of the Samudri and witness the festival. So you had, they write about rockets going on across there. Uh, in fact, our Vijayanagara. So the Mandapa, you know, where you had the Navratri festival. So there are there are vivid uh, descriptions of rockets being fired from there. We assume that they would all be wooden rockets. So it was not just through Kerala, rocket field is happening all over. Uh, yeah. <coughs> my name is Mahmoud uh, My question was, you know, basically just wanted to understand. There was so much of, uh, you know, industry that was flourished at I mean, that point of time. Now, suddenly, 1799 and then post-4th uh, Anglo-Mysore War, what happens to the industry? I mean, did the Britishers, I mean, I know a lot of research happened in England, but what happened in India? Did they, uh, I mean, East India Company, did they take this forward in India using the, uh, you know, rocket uh, technology in other wars and battles till 1857 or something like that? Yes, rocket technology was used because that's what Congress did. And later on, it was used well up to the 1830s. And it was used very effectively uh, when they burned Copenhagen, uh, when they uh, fired upon uh, in America, when they yeah. went from Canada, they went into America and uh, North America, and it was also used in the Napoleonic Wars uh, to, to some good effect. Uh, it did not turn any war, Copenhagen War, it burned the city of Copenhagen, Copenhagen capitulated, especially because of the rockets. But I will not say that during the Napoleonic Wars, I mean, it really scared the the French so much now. Uh, but about, so essentially the East India Company was a large, the England and India uh, was a large business enterprise. Right? It was a corporation, it was a, it was a 
So whatever technologies were beneficial and useful to them, they would use. What technology they felt could be replaced with technology that came in from, from England, this technology would be discarded. That's how corporations work. And that's how they work. So that's why a lot of native technologies, not just rocket making, but you take styles, handicrafts, all that just went in fact, a very interesting thing that you asked that I just didn't mention. Sure. See, uh, you, we call all, as I study arms and armor, how many, you know, we see a sword, all of us, Karnataka, at least we call it a kati, at one, we call it a chaku. Uh, in North India, every, every sword is called a talwar, uh, and again a chaku. But how many of us know that each had a different name, like today a car could be a sand thrower, Whatever, a wagonar, whatever. So you have you have a khanda, you have a kharga, you have a chaku, you have a banka, uh, you have a katti, you have a pirangi, uh, you have a gupti. Uh, so there are so many, each has a different name, but we just forgotten that because of the arms act and the earlier the banner man. Mm -hmm. So in 17, 1800, Mysore, that is old Mysore proper, Colonel Bannerman, I mean, he was one of them. Garrison commanders, we he ordered a confiscation of general weapons to prevent any unrest. Uh, after the Nagar Dali in 1830s, we in Shimoga lost the right to carry arms. And all over India after 1857, the first war of independence, the arms act came to place, which is still in place now. So we even forgot the names of each of these weapons. We call everything the generic term, Karti Atwa Chapo. So a lot of these things happen this way. So when they discourage certain things, we lose memory. Perhaps you can come back to BAC and talk about the arms. <laughs> so, I think uh, after listening to Nidhin, I think we, I mean, perhaps we all need to move past the broadening debates we seem to be having. We want to celebrate you for the innovator that he was. Perhaps it's an easier approach. Far more rigorous and far more rewarding also to do this. Uh, thank you, Nidin, for this fascinating lecture. Well, thank you, everybody.